Let me tell you a little bit about the more abstract again and the more, you know, towards the <coughs> political decision layer. I mean, what are the, the, the large scale effects that we are seeing with free software? Of course, you know, no presentation can go without this slide. What is free software? I mean, I, I heard in your presentation, as far as I was able to understand, that you, you know, made the point that it is about freedom, not price. And that is something that you should always emphasize to people who have not heard of the concept before. Free software can be sold. It is being sold. It is also commercial software. There is non-commercial free software and there is commercial free software. It depends on how you want to use it. In particular, it is four freedoms that define free software. It is the freedom of unlimited use for any purpose. It is the freedom to study and to modify for your own needs. It is the freedom to copy and the freedom to distribute modifications. Software that gives you these four freedoms is free software. That definition was first published January 1989 and has ever since been the definition of the term free software. Freedom sounds rather abstract. It has to be implemented. The way we do it generally is through copyright or droit d'auteur, right of the author. An author, the copyright holder of a program can choose a license and the license then gives you the freedom. There is a lot of free software licenses out there which I'm not going to go into. I'm going to save us this. The, the acronyms down there are the most often found ones. But you can always know whether a piece of software is free software by looking at the license and checking does this license give me these freedoms. If it does, it is a free software license. The freedom to study is very important for education. It has significant implications for education. For one, there is no secret art you see, there is no part for which you are not entitled to know how it works. There is no part that is secret knowledge, only available to people who are initiated. You can learn it. And in fact, there are no built-in barriers either. So you can choose to learn it as far or as little as you want. But it is your decision how far and how much you want to learn. And there are no sandbox games. This is the real thing. You do not study hypothetical situations. No, you can actually look at the real thing. The things you can learn from is the state of the art. It is what is the best that we can do today. So you can actually learn from the best directly. You have instant access of the knowledge of the best. Also, Free software helps you get away from the you know, Pavlovian habit training. You know, sadly enough, most of our IT education these days is product schooling. It is nothing else. It is pure product schooling. How do I use that product of that company? That is like you know, teaching children how to operate microwaves or can openers. That is not exactly what we want them to, t to understand. We want them to understand the principles behind it. So free software allows you to, to shift the paradigm from teaching products to learning principles. And no privileges for the rich. I know that 
several proprietary software companies say, oh, it's no problem, we're going to outfit your schools, we're going to you know, give you all the licenses, that is not a problem. Now, they're forgetting about one thing. When pupils do their homework, they actually need the same software at home, which means when you use proprietary products, you obligate the parents of all the children to buy that software for their computers at home. They cannot take it home. With free software, they can. The, the students are encouraged to take home the software. And in fact, they're even encouraged to teach their parents, their grandparents, how to use it. So you have a horizontal transfer of knowledge within society even. And that is a wanted effect. It is perfectly legal. It is encouraged to do so. It also has significant impact on science, which is how we reach knowledge. We all know that the scientific method depends upon the free exchange of knowledge and thoughts. What is often not so well understood is that it depends upon falsification and expansion. You see, in science we work the way that we have a theory that we try to show that it's true. We validate it, in scientific speak. Once it has been validated once, just once, we assume that it is true. We can validate it an infinite amount of times. It never becomes more true than true. But if I just show once that it does not work, just once, I know that the theory is either you know, so faulty that I have to discard it altogether or I have to modify it. So a single falsification can undo an unlimited amount of verifications. Falsification allows us to get rid of theories that are not true. Now, when we have software as part of our scientific experiment, and that is increasingly the case these days, and that is not, you know, doing an experiment, typing it into, you know, proprietary word processor and printing it out. That does not affect the scientific content. What I'm talking about is having the software as part of the experiment. Anyone who has ever dealt with computers, anyone who ever programmed, knows that the algorithm does not tell you everything you have to know about a program. The implementation becomes part of the result. You have to know whether the effect that you are seeing is part of the implementation or part of the algorithm. If you cannot tell, you have no idea what is happening in there. So what proprietary software in science actually gives you is a little black box with a button and a light and a post-it note. And on the post-it note it says, oh, if you, you know, push this little button, then experiment X happens. And if that was successful, the light goes on. So I push the button and the light comes on and now I'm a scientist. I don't think so. You see, what proprietary software does in science is it takes away the ability to falsify because I cannot tell whether that box has been hardwired or not. I have no way of telling. So the obvious conclusion from this is that in fact proprietary software as an approach is incompatible with the scientific method. We break the scientific principle if we base our knowledge on proprietary software. Free software, on the other hand, does allow us to control the algorithms, to control their implementation and their operation. It does allow us to port scientific software to other platforms, which is incredibly important. Because science is not only what we know today, it is also how we got there. It is understanding the thoughts of the generations before us. If the experiment depends upon a certain piece of proprietary platform, and a, that depends itself on a certain piece of hardware, how big is the chance that you can find just that combination in a hundred years? We take away the ability to follow our thoughts if we base science on proprietary software. So it does help us to archive and preserve the knowledge of humankind. There are significant social aspects that free software carries within itself. Access to software determines so many things for us. The average US citizen on an average day allegedly communicates 250 times, interacts 250 times a day with software. Anyone, children, seniors, you know, people in Iowa, 
anyone. So 250 interactions, and most of them actually unconscious. This is where I always hope for mobile phones to ring, because people think a mobile phone is a phone. It's not. It is a computer. It is a little computer, you know, a little bucket of chips with software that turns it into a phone. Access to software nowadays increasingly determines about our ability to communicate, to study and to work. If I need a certain piece of software to talk to you, then whoever controls my access to that piece of software controls my ability to talk to you. If I can only get a certain piece of knowledge through software, then whoever controls my access to that piece of software controls my access to that knowledge. And if I need a certain piece of software to do my job, then whoever controls my ability to get to that software controls my ability to do the job. What we have to understand as a society, collectively, is that software is the cultural technique of the digital age. It is not the first. We have discovered many cultural techniques, you know, reading, writing, math, agriculture. There's a lot of them. But we have to understand that software is the cultural technique of the digital age. And whenever humankind discovers a cultural technique, I want each and every one of you to ask one question. Who controls it? Who determines who has access to the cultural technique? Who is entitled to decide who can participate in society? Who has that kind of power? Who should have it? Well, the answer that free software gives is that each and every one of us, independent from you know, wealth, color of hair, color of skin, eyesight, toenails, I don't know what, each and every one of us has the same right, the same freedom to participate. Let me do a brief detour into national economy here, because there is this long-term effect by using free software in education in particular that affects national economy indirectly, very significantly. Business requires, in general, communication between vendors and customers. I think you know, there isn't, we don't have to debate this one. We have a second fact that we know from sociology that each and every one of us knows any other over no more than five others. I mean, sometimes it's six, sometimes even seven. Here it may be less, I don't know. But there is a finite number of people that connect us to each other. We could all play the game to, to go to any person in this room and try to find the people that we know each other through or over. And then we know from experience that proprietary software tends to only work properly with itself. If I want to work with somebody who uses a certain piece of proprietary software, I usually have to have the same piece of proprietary software. Very often even the same version. Anyone who has ever upgraded from one proprietary word processor's version to another knows that very often the files will not get read properly. It's a hassle. And even that hassle is often enough to make the cooperation difficult to impossible. Now, theoretically, open standards provide a way out of this. But that is misleading because, you see, so far in the last 30 years, never ever has any proprietary software vendor resisted the temptation to improve an open standard in a way that you could migrate to that implementation, to that vendor's product, but not away from it anymore. Never have we seen such a case. That effect is in fact so common that it has its own term. There is a term, vendor lock-in, that was coined for that kind of behavior. It is so common. What happens if we add these three? Let's add them up we immediately realize that the proprietary software system has a monopolizing tendency. There is a, a system inherent tendency in the system to build a monopoly. So it's not, it's actually, I'm not saying, you know, that Microsoft is evil. In fact, I, I think Microsoft was the natural consequence of the system. We had to have something like it. 
and they do not limit themselves to software because they proliferate into the hardware domain. You see, the, this bundling of one piece of hardware comes with one piece of software and one piece of software only runs on that hardware, it's a deliberate effect. That is why people refer to it as the Wintel monopoly. But that is the natural result of the system. If it were not those companies, it would be someone else. We just exchange the name of whoever rules us if we you know, just destroy the company without changing the system. And this does not only affect the software and hardware companies of a country. No, I mean, this is from Germany, a Fraunhofer ISST study. More than 50% of all German industry and more than 80% of all the exports, and Germany is an export nation, depend on ICT, information, community, um, information communication technologies, actually are a fundament. They are a business enabler, as they are called in business speech. And that business enabler with free software is independent and equally available for all. Free software has networking effects that encourage local vendors and services. You see, you can have local people solve the problem of the people in that country. It encourages local industry and economy. You can actually have the knowledge in the country and transfer it between the citizens of a country. And there's one very good example where this is put in practice. India is a very interesting country. It has a lot of people it has a high illiteracy rate, lots of social problems, and very little money. So they are, you would think, in a very bad situation. So what have they done? They wanted to increase, increase the computer literacy of the population. Well, they could never afford buying you know, hard and software from the north and distributing it to their people. Plus, it wouldn't really help them anyway. Not in the long term, not as much as what they have done has helped them, because instead they chose to have local engineers design a PDA, personal digital assistant, these little handheld devices. Then they set up local factories to produce them and a local company <coughs> to sell them. It started shipping a month and a half or two months ago for 150 US dollars. They think they can bring down the price to $100. Why could they do that? Because of free software. Free software allows you to port it to other platforms. So you ha they had the freedom to use the full power of free software. This is not breadcrumbs of the rich people's table. This is the real thing. Their software is by no means worse than the software I have on this laptop. It is the same thing. And here comes the beauty of it. When India now decides to say, okay, let's increase the computer literacy of our population. So we set up an educational program and put a lot of money into these computers to educate our people. We give them out to the poor. What happens? Well, the money goes to the people <coughs> who shipped it in the country, to the company that sold it, to the factory that produced it, to the engineers that designed it. At all times cert does the money circulate in India. So the money keeps circulating in India instead of just jumping out of the country in the first hop as it does for proprietary software. And it does that in Europe and here is uh, the same way. I mean Europe suffers from this as much as you do. It's just much richer so it can, it can suffer this a little longer. But even Europe has started to feel that pressure. So free software does allow you to set up a sustainable local soft and hardware industry. It does empower the national economy to a level that was unknown before. And when you have people leaving the schools knowing about free software, some of them starting business with, with free software, some of them becoming customers of free software, you actually encourage such network growth. Let me draw a resume. Free software offers the best answers that we know today. I'm not saying the only answers, I'm not saying the best answers for all time, but the best answers we know today for education, science, society, and national economy.
in the information age. And the choice really is ours. We can make that choice. And we can build a sustainable future upon this. We simply have to choose it. Thank you.